welcome to my opening speaker of today. I'd like to welcome to the stage Nick Saperano. He's going to be talking about Back to the Roots. What is crypto really for? Now, Nick is the co-founder and chief information officer of the Divi Project. He is a crypto investor since 2015, and his programming expertise spans across multiple blockchain frameworks, such as Ethereum, Hyperledger, and Pivx. Nick has been featured as a cryptocurrency and blockchain expert on Cheddar, and uh, CNBC, Quartz, investing.com, nasdaq.com, This Week in Tech, and much more. Can you please give him a very warm welcome to the stage? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you guys so much. It is always a pleasure to grace the stage at Anarchapulco, who's so excited to be here today. I know I am. It's my second year here at the event. In it's true, there are amazing speakers and so much to consume over the course of this week or weekend. My name is Nick Sapinero, and as I was just introduced, I'm the Chief Information Officer at the Divi Project, which is a cryptocurrency startup that is aimed at making cryptocurrency easier to access and use. I got into the space in 2015, uh, right after the Ethereum ICO ended, so late 2014, early 2015. Didn't know much about crypto. Frankly, I was getting into it to make a quick buck. Somebody told me about it. I was a programmer at the time, so it was kind of cool, but again, I, I really didn't know much about it. Like many of you, probably, I have heard about Bitcoin many, many years before, but either didn't have the money or the interest to pursue investing in it or mining it. So obviously, getting into Ethereum early was awesome. You know, it went up to 20 bucks and I got into the DAO, which was the first Ethereum ICO. Was anybody else in the DAO? We got one, oh, two DAO guys. Oh, geez. So the DAO obviously didn't work out. And that kind of soured my outlook on cryptocurrency for a while. I kind of gave up on it for a long time, probably almost a year. Until somebody, one of my friends, we were like out at a club or something, and he's like, he's like, yeah, I just bought this Ethereum thing. It was like 45 bucks and now it's 68. You should definitely look at, check it out. I was like, it's 68? Okay, I gotta check this out again. But I said, if I'm gonna get back into this, and thankfully I hadn't sold anything, I'm gonna get back into this. I'm not gonna get back in for the wrong reasons. I'm not gonna get back in for the reasons that I got in in the first place. I'm gonna learn about this technology as it pertains to humanity, as it pertains to technology. And that's why I'm here today to talk to you about getting back to the roots what is crypto really for? You know, I think it's an 11 year old technology at this point, and there are a lot of narratives going on simultaneously. So throughout the process of this presentation, we're gonna talk about a lot of things. We're gonna talk about sort of the social dynamics that influence cryptocurrency's ability to achieve mass adoption, where we are on the scale of mass adoption, and how we might actually get there. And of course, we'll try to answer the question what is this technology actually meant for? So what does it mean to crypto enthusiasts? I see a couple uh, HODL shirts out there and some crypto shirts. We got a lot of crypto enthusiasts out there. Raise your hands. Good amount. Good. So for us, and I'm sure a lot of the people that are at this conference, cryptocurrency offers the promise of freedom, personal sovereignty, the ability to be financially secure, to do whatever you want. And of course, in doing this, we're able to defeat the banks, right? That's what got me, really. I hate, hate the global banking system. I hate just even the national banking systems. I'm sure a lot of you can agree. I've had several Venmo accounts shut down. I've had PayPal shut down. I mean, I've had my actual bank accounts shut down because of this technology. They're trying to beat us, but they can't. They can't stop it, can they? So this global, borderless currency that has the same exchange rate everywhere, it's an amazing, amazing thing to us. And of course, the ability to be private is a huge benefit. I mean, who doesn't want a fully transparent yet untraceable way to send money? And probably the most important to the real hardcore crypto enthusiast is the aspect of decentralization. No central point of failure, and maybe more importantly, no central point of 
control, right? This huge network of nodes that's all running the same copy of the same blockchain. It gives us the ability to have consensus and trustlessness. We don't have to trust each other anymore. Unfortunately, we're a really niche crowd, aren't we? There's not very many crypto enthusiasts. And sadly, and I hate to say it, and you guys are going to learn this throughout this presentation, I'm a realist, I'm optimistic, but I look at things in a very, very real light. Most people, this is how they see crypto. Am I wrong? <laughs> it's true. But it doesn't have to be this way. Of course, we can look at what it's technically for. And I'm going to use a phrase that the US Navy actually coined in 1960, which is KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. It's digital branded money, right? It's just a way of sending money. It just has a brand, a brand name, Bitcoin, Monero, Divi. So if it's so great, where is everybody? Why is every seat in this room not filled? Why are all the conferences losing attendance? When mass adoption? Well, let's take a look at how adoption actually occurs. Anyone seen this chart before? It's pretty common. So what you have here is the diffusion of innovation. The blue bell curve is the adoption cycle. And the yellow sine wave is the market capitalization or market share as it pertains to the adoption cycle. And as you can see in the beginning, adoption and market share pretty much track each other. But there comes a point this apex, where it kind of takes off. The late majority starts to come in, and especially once the laggards start to enter, you really dominate the entire market. So where are we? How far are we from that 100% sine wave? We got to look at the numbers if we want to find out. So this is actually a, a study that Cointelegraph conducted in 2019. To be fair, it was a small sample across 22 countries, about 50,000 people in the sample size. So obviously, it's not perfect, but I just want you to understand that, you know, you can lie with statistics. I'm not trying to. This is a good sample, so I'm going to use it. Let's start from the top, right? We have, whoops, I'm sorry. We have 81% have never purchase cryptocurrency. That means only 19% of this sample has ever even touched cryptocurrency, 19%. 10% said they fully understand how they work. That means there's 9% of people floating out there that just bought this stuff with absolutely no idea what it is. That was me in 2015, right? What are we doing? 35% of people think it's a fad. Have you, uh, I just went back east for, for Christmas. I talked to a lot of my old friends. And they all said the same thing. You still doing that Bitcoin thing? I was like, well, kind of, yeah, yeah, of course. They're like, oh, I thought that kind of faded out. A lot of people do think it's a fad. A lot of people, once the Facebook posts stop, it doesn't exist to them at all. But probably the most staggering statistic is that 14% of those who are not currently using cryptocurrency would actually like to try it. Only 14% of the people out there who haven't touched crypto want to try. So let's break this down on a grander scale. Again, I'm going to use that sample size from the Cointelegraph research to apply to the rest of the world. The numbers aren't going to be perfect, but it's close enough for the sake of argument. There's 7.8 billion people on Earth and counting. Of that, there are about, we'll say, 1.5 billion people who own cryptocurrency. That's pretty good. That's a lot of people, right? Decent. And then we also have those 884 million people that want to try it out. And then you have this. 5.4 billion people that have no interest whatsoever. Now, that will change. Just like all technology, that adoption curve applies to every single industry that has ever been born. In the beginning, people don't want to deal with it. They don't want to touch it. Over time, their minds change. But right now, this is where we are, the very early adopter phase. So if you own cryptocurrency, congratulations. You're an early adopter. Yeah, give yourselves a hand. Incredible. But we have a long way to go. 
to reach that apex of the late majority. And the reasoning behind our difficulty, we'll say, in garnering mass adoption is the fact that cryptocurrency is not, right now, equipped to work at scale. It doesn't really work like a currency. Don't believe me? Jack Dorsey does. He says, Bitcoin is functional but does not work like a currency yet. But he's working every day to try to make it work, isn't he? He's an amazing, he's an amazing entrepreneur. He's doing great things. So how do we get to the point where it does work like a currency? Not just Bitcoin, but all cryptocurrencies. The problem is that we don't always agree. Just like everything in life, I have this idea, you have this idea, but we're kind of trying to do the same thing, but we're going to go in different directions to do so. How do we achieve that critical mass together? Now, I'm a technologist, so of course I'm going to look from a logical perspective first. How do scientists achieve critical mass? They ignite a chain reaction that ignites other chain reactions that essentially become unstoppable over time. Of course, in like nuclear physics, they're controlling this to create fission or do whatever they're doing with it. Unfortunately, in social dynamics, it works almost the opposite way, where the larger the group or the larger that chain reaction, the more chance it has to stop. And I'll tell you why. Collective action is sort of a double-edged sword, right? You, you know, I had a professor once. He said, uh, and I don't know if this was his quote, so don't give him too much credit if, it, if it's not. Uh, he said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I loved that quote. And I always thought, how the hell does that apply in real life when you have so many people working on something? You know, a school of fish, I love this graphic because a school of fish does really do this. They work collectively to not only get where they're going, but to protect themselves, and they actually move a little bit faster in the jet stream or whatever it's called. I'm not a marine biologist. If you haven't read this book yet, I highly recommend it. Menker Olson is a, uh, an economist who wrote this thesis um, called The Logic of Collective Action. In it, he talks about how groups of people of self-serving individuals, which we all are, actually tend to undermine the collective action of the group that they participate in. And it's not really their fault, it's just human nature. And it's, it all comes down to this word right here, altruism. If humans were altruistic truly, we would work together, just selflessly, to make something happen. In this case, to achieve mass adoption or to get people to download the Bitcoin wallets or whatever. Now, in my opinion, and the opinion of Manker Olson, individuals and groups are not altruistic. Sorry if that's a spoiler for anybody, by the way. Perfect example, sorry. Perfect example of our inherent counterintuitiveness as human beings. You ever try to merge into a lane on the highway? You know, it goes from two lanes to one. Now, if we worked as a collective to move traffic smoothly forward, we would zipper in. Person in the right lane goes, person in the left lane goes, and so on and so forth. And it would move slower, but it would move. But if you've ever been on the 405 in LA at rush hour, you know that's not what happens at all. <laughs> Another great example of this, which I think may resonate better with this group, taxes. Would you pay taxes voluntarily? No. I hate taxes too, but we all have to pay them. It's a compulsory obligation in every single government that exists. There's never been a government on earth that has compulsory taxation, or non-compulsory taxation, right? The reason is because tragedy of the commons, right? If I don't have to, I won't. Somebody else will. But if everybody thinks like that, then no one does. It is called free riding. If I'm the only one paying taxes, then somebody's riding on me, right? And this actually does happen. We see it all the time in our actual government. People free riding the system. People free riding on people who are paying taxes. In our case, we have to incentivize our group in different ways. For us, like I said in the beginning, crypto enthusiasts, we're incentivized by freedom, beating the banks, privacy, censorship resistance, decentralization. 
But again, it's not enough of an incentive for this small group to grow. And what actually ends up happening is the group can't scale. You end up with smaller subsets of groups forming within the collective. And again, these small subsets undermine the overall objective. It's a pain. But unfortunately, that's how humans work. Why do we gamify all of our apps now? Because we need incentive. We need incentive to do something. You're not going to do anything without a proper incentive. And if the incentive isn't great enough, like in the, person of who's, uh, in the case of the person who's free riding the government, their incentive to pay taxes isn't greater than the incentive to free ride. And it's a failed system. From those small subsets of groups, you end up with what are called selective incentives. And it's sad, because you're really all trying to do the same thing, right? I love this example of the, of the tug of war, because they're all doing the same thing, right? They're pulling a rope, but they're pulling it in opposite directions. They'll never get anywhere. That's where we are when we are creating subsets of groups, intention, infighting, etc., within our own cryptocurrency communities. Another <laughs> perfect example is the two-party system, right? They sort of put on this show that there are two sides of the, of the government, trying to do the same thing, govern, provide services for the people in that government, but in reality, they're just creating all of these small groups and selective incentives to enrich themselves, and it breaks the system, and it breaks it for us, the people that are supposed to benefit from the public good that they serve. Selective incentives kill systems, and they create tribalism. Another great book you should definitely check out, Sarah Rose Cavanaugh, Hive Mind, amazing, amazing writer. And the book is basically about how humans are inherently tribal, right? We've always formed tribes. Since recorded history started, paintings on walls, you can tell that there were tribes of people. We've always seeked out people who are like-minded. Look at this room. We've seeked each other out. We're all here for the same reason, generally. And people have always done this. And especially now that social media exists, tribes form in incredibly fast, ways, and they spread incredibly fast. Even misinformation, even tribes that are spreading the wrong information spread fast. And you have what are called maximalists arriving from these tribes. And a maximalist is just simply someone with basically disproportionately uncompromising extreme views. They will not change their mind no matter what you say. And it's the biggest hindrance to cryptocurrency mass adoption that exists. Does anybody consider themselves a maximalist in here? One. I'm surprised you admitted it. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Mo most people won't admit that they're a maximalist. Some people don't know that they are. But I can tell you that it's not the way to go. And I'm going to prove it. When you, when you are a maximalist, and there are other maximalists out there in other competing tribes, you end up with these competing narratives. You end up with an LA parking schedule's worth of competing narratives. Sorry, LA, I'm, I'm from San Diego, I just, I hate the traffic. I always say that Satoshi is Bitcoin's greatest feature and its greatest flaw. Why? Because Satoshi is anonymous. It's super cool, right? To us. But there's also no one to direct the narrative. There's also no one to direct the direction of the coin or of the project. There's no one to go on CNBC and defend us when Mnuchin gets on and says that Bitcoin's the only thing used for money laundering. I actually saw him say the US dollar hasn't been used successfully to launder money the other day on a video. <laughs> what? What are you talking, where's Satoshi now? He should be there to say you're a bullshitter and I'm gonna prove it, right? But we don't know who Satoshi is. And unfortunately, you have people that are presumed to be Satoshi and people that presume themselves to be Satoshi. And none of it helps. Because especially the people that presume themselves to be Satoshi, they get on stage and they start more infighting and more tribes and more contention. I don't need to remind you guys about the contentious hard fork that caused the Bitcoin price to plummet last year. Maximalism is also a fallacy. 
especially with Bitcoin. Because first to market does not mean first or last to exit, right? We've seen this time and time and time again in technology. Everyone remembers AOL? Does anyone remember Mosaic? Yeah, I was born that year. What if we were just like, oh, AOL's it? That's it. Nothing could ever be better, ever. And if you think I'm wrong, fuck you. Wouldn't work. How about MySpace, place for friends? Anyone even remember Friendster? Yeah. I don't even think I had access to the internet yet with Friendster. I definitely had MySpace, it was awesome. But MySpace still exists, right? So does AOL in some capacity, just not the capacity that it forged the way for. BlackBerry, unfortunately, not really around anymore, but it did pave the way for innovation, just like Bitcoin is paving the way for innovation. We're already seeing incredible projects come as a result of Bitcoin. And I don't think that Bitcoin's gonna go away. I'm, I'm wearing fucking Bitcoin socks, you see? <laughs> I love Bitcoin. I build technology that supports Bitcoin every single day at my job. So trust me, I'm not an anti-Bitcoin person. But I do not believe that it is the end-all be-all. And I do not believe there is any coin that will be the end-all be-all. I believe that there will take many coins. I don't know what's gonna drive that next wave of adoption. But we can compare Bitcoin to, or I'm sorry, cryptocurrency to the traditional markets to further prove the point that we need to collaborate to win. Okay, I'm using NASDAQ in this example because NASDAQ is uh, the tech stock exchange. Is that fair? You can use whatever stock exchange you want. NASDAQ has a market cap of $10 trillion. Cryptocurrency has a market cap of $3 billion. Can everybody see that from the back? Because I can barely see it from here. It's tiny, we're a blip on their radar. If we want to even compete we have to join hands and come together. Let's move forward. Dominance does not equal monopoly. monopoly. We can see that even if Bitcoin does retain its 65% market share, which is fine, that'd be sweet, there would still be, in the NASDAQ example, $3.5 trillion of market share to go around. You think a couple projects might be able to fit in there? A couple, maybe? In traditional business, 66% of businesses fail within the first 10 years. This is traditional business. You know, starting up a pet store or whatever. But 92% of crypto startups failed in 2018. 92%, it's a huge number, right? That's what they were saying on the news all the time. 92% of cryptocurrencies failed, ICOs are a scam. A lot of them were. And the bear market of 2018 was no joke. Trust me, I was there for it. But out of, I guess, let me compare this, right? I'm gonna give you some context. A lot of companies failed, why? Because they were mismanaging money, they were founders that had no experience, they were founders that were plagiarizing white papers or putting stuff up that they had no intention of pursuing, right? It's the literal same thing that caused the dot-com bubble to pop. People were raising insane amounts of capital, doing nothing. You know Ethereum only raised $2.3 million? Google, two. Amazon, I think it's like 2.1. You don't need $20 million to start any company, really. Two million is a lot of money, if you're smart. But still, out of the dot-com bubble, 48% of those startups survived. A lot of people don't realize that. It's a lot of, a lot of companies that, that made it out, all the way to 2004, when the market started to stabilize again. And if we actually look at the number, because you see, <laughs> The media loves to use statistics to lie to you, and that's why I've been so clear about how I'm using statistics in this presentation. 92% of cryptos failed, but 200 survived. 200 out of 2,500 businesses survived 2018. Let's talk about that. Let's change the narrative to that. Hmm? That's an amazing, amazing shirt. I mean, metric. 2,500 or more new cryptocurrencies have emerged since 2018. Will it be any different this time? I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully we've learned a lesson. But even still, even if, you know, the same failure rate occurs, that's like, what, 900 companies that would survive out of 5,000 that exist today? I mean, check coin market cap every day, there's like 10 more. It's crazy. 
what are these guys doing even? I don't know. But, I'm like Costanza over here. But I know one thing. Collaboration is going to be key. Projects have to work together. We're at a 300 billion market cap. How do we get to one trillion? How do we get to five? How do we get to 10? It's not by tribalizing. It's not by sticking by your coin and saying it's the best and screaming at everybody who's not with you. Because you know what that looks like from the outside? It looks terrible. People don't want to see fighting, infighting, founders closing companies because they can't get along. As a, as a, you know, a well-versed, educated investor, I'm going to look at that and say, eh, I think I'm going to stay away from that. So what is it? What is crypto really for? Is it digital money? Is it a way to beat the banks? Is it a way to beat the governments? Yeah, it's all that stuff. To me, though, it's connection, collaboration, and empowering humanity. Bottom line. And I pray, pray, pray that the next time somebody asks you what crypto is, you will say the same thing. Thank you. Do I have time for questions? I got time for questions if anybody has any. They don't have to be about the presentation. I'll, I'll answer other questions. No sports, though. What's up? So Divi is a cryptocurrency startup. We build basically world-class digital finance solutions. We do have a blockchain, the Divi blockchain. And um, we built the first one-click masternode. So our whole sort of philosophy on crypto is to make it easy and interoperable with other cryptocurrencies and with fiat. Um, so like I said, we built the first one-click masternode to make earning cryptocurrency extremely easy and to build our network. And recently we acquired a fintech arm that allows us to provide um, fiat services. So now we can provide, um, in the upcoming app that we're releasing, we'll be able to provide IBANs, so international bank account numbers to literally anyone, including the unbanked world, uh, with as little as a, a ID and a phone number, um, as well as fiat on and off ramp, exchange services, and things like that. Um, but it's not just about Divi, it's about all cryptos. So it's a multi-coin wallet. We'll launch with uh, Bitcoin and Divi, but you can use the desktop app to deploy masternodes now. I wasn't here to shill. I promise that was not a plant. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Wow. That means so much to me, and I'm, I'm sure it'll mean a ton to them as well. Um, if you couldn't hear, he just complimented our support staff, who are literally like online 24 seven. They live and breathe heavy, it's amazing. Um, I'll, I'll let them know you said that and they'll see the video eventually. Sure. Yes. You're correct. A lot of people are choosing to use basically banks to hold their cryptocurrency. Um, that's a scary, a scary thought um, because it kind of is like the antithesis of what this was all built for. Um, you're right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there are people that, are, that have adopted crypto but just aren't, you know, with wallets or, or whatever. But those are probably like that 10% that don't understand how it works, or 9%, whatever it was. I don't remember the exact number. Back in the back. About the Trezor wallet, what about it? I've always used Ledger. Um, Trezor's, I mean, a good option as well. There, there have been several points throughout the life cycles of both of those products that, um, that have revealed security flaws if the person is with you. But I mean, to me, the biggest security flaw if somebody is with me who wants to steal my crypto is a gun or a wrench. <laughs> so I mean, uh, but yeah, I mean, you're right. It's, it's definitely something to consider. I can't personally vouch for any other wallets because I haven't used them. But um, there are others out there, like keep, Key, I think, is one. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, of course. So we did. Um, actually, we didn't do this. The Digibyte community.
created a Divi masternode on their platform recently. So it actually offered people to offered the people the ability to purchase a portion of a Divi masternode. Uh, the, our lowest level masternode is about fifteen hundred bucks right now. Um, so for some people, that's that's expensive, right? And it's a little bit out of reach. You don't want to make that investment. These guys created on their Dig Digibyte blockchain a uh, sort of tokenized version of a, of a masternode that actually pays out rewards in Digibyte. And I had them on our podcast to talk about it. It's awesome. Um, Dragon Chain is doing some integrations with us right now. And we're always looking. If you guys, if anybody has a crypto project and, and sees an angle, please let us know. I'm sorry? Yeah, what coins are we going to have in the wallet? Yes. So at launch, it'll be Bitcoin, Divi, and three different fiat currencies. So we'll have Costa Rican Colonis, USD, and Euro. Um, from there, we'll add probably just like the top 10 coins. Um, and from there, it'll be about our collaborative partners. So, you know, we're doing stuff with Polis Pay. Um, they'll probably end up in there. Digibyte, of course, will end up in there. Litecoin, I think it's still top 10. Um, Dash. Pivot, you know, all of, our, all of our counterparts and some of our competitors as well. The goal is to eventually create a, an ecosystem that you can quickly and easily sort of uh, work your way through. If you want to get into or out of Bitcoin into Monero or whatever other coin you're looking at, it should be instant and fast and easy at the click of a button. And that's our goal. Ethereum, ERC20, all that stuff. So I'm going to go to him and we can come back. You know, it's, since I started Divi, I have so, so little time to actually look at stuff. Um, Enigma is one that I think is, is pretty interesting, doing private smart contracts. I think that, that was something that Vitalik probably would have done himself. Um, so seeing that being, being built is cool. And Casper Labs is another one that I think is, has a lot of potential. Um, maybe, a, maybe a little bit of a danger to, to Ethereum, but an amazing project nonetheless. We uh, we have any time left? Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Um, we're we're still working that out. We just sort of. Oh, I'm sorry. He asked, "What are the what are the fees for uh, for transitioning between fiat and crypto?" Um, less than Coinbase. The goal is to actually drive the fees to nothing, um, because we own the financial technology company that provides our banking services we can work with them to interoperate our coin to uh, incentivize users to use the coin and eventually bring the fees to near nothing or nothing. That's the, that's the ultimate goal. Right here. It's on the table. I mean, I did mention Dash. Um, a lot of it will come down to, unfortunately, regulations. Because we're operating in so many jurisdictions, it's really important that we follow the rules. Um, which, you know, not super anarchy, <laughs> but, uh, but it is what it is. We're trying to run a business too, you know. But yeah, we're, we're considering it for sure. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, that may even come out sooner than Wallet 2.0. He asked about ledger support for, for Divi. Yeah, it's, it's like 50 to 60% finished. We just had to work on some other stuff. So kind of took a back seat, but we'll get back to it. Small team, you know, 15 devs or something. Conservatively, 10 years. I mean, to even reach like the near the apex of that. Um, if we look at like uh, internet or computing, computing took a lot longer because we didn't have computers. <laughs> um, so the internet's probably a, a good benchmark, and that was like 30 or 40 years to really reach ubiquity. Um, so I'd probably expect to see you know, a 20 to 30 year lifespan or uh, adoption cycle for this technology as well. Maybe a little faster, because we, again, we have the internet, uh, which is why I say 10 years, which would put us at 21 years total. Do you think that could be accelerated if there's a huge price, say, in the normal banking system? Yeah, I often think about that, because this isn't the internet. Like, this actually solves a different problem. Um, and we've already seen, you know, governments 
uh, being super irresponsible with their treasuries and, and their central banking systems like Venezuela and, uh, and Turkey and, and Greece and stuff like that. So it could, and we do see some adoption in Venezuela. We have a huge Venezuelan community. So it definitely is serving that need. So yeah, I mean, I don't like to speculate too much, but it could definitely happen. <laughs> I'm having legal fee issues. <laughs> it's, it's very expensive, um, but we have an amazing team of attorneys that are looking at this every single day and making sure that we don't go to jail, because I would hate that. <laughs> Anyone else? No? Okay. Sorry? Depending on their monetary policy, yeah. Sure. I love DAI. I think it's a really smart, a smart method. I don't know how I feel about, I mean, I do know how I feel about Tether, actually. Um, <laughs> I don't support it. <laughs> I don't believe it. Um, anyway, yeah, to some extent. Anyone else? Wow, thank you guys so many, so many questions, that was awesome. <laughs>